thought, we thought the cryotechnology had a much less risk of doing that because in the initial clinical trials, for many years, there wasn't even a case report that the cryotechnology could do that. There have now been some case reports where even freezing technology can do the same thing. Okay, so we wanted, a, we wanted a reliable procedure, but we also wanted a very safe procedure. So that's why we tend to use cryo. So as of about a few months ago, until this new technology got approved, those were basically the two strategies to try to get vein isolation. So that strategy works very good in come and go AFib. But what about the persistent AFib? What do you think the single procedure success rate for vein isolation is with the persistent AFib? Anybody want to take a guess? No. Very good. No, it's actually not good. I'm doing well. It doesn't work in everybody because once the proverbial genie is out of the bottle and the atrium gets, when you go into AFib and it stays there persistently, even if you isolate the veins, the process is still in the upper chamber. It's hard to get it back under control. There's another wicked thing the body does after you go into AFib. It's called remodeling. So once you go into AFib, the body sets up the process to stay in AFib. Okay? There's a famous saying in our line of work, AFib begets AFib. So once the process starts, it tends to be persistent. Okay? So if you take simple vein isolation strategy that we do a lot of and you apply it to somebody who's been an AFib, say for example for a year, the single procedure success rate can be very, very low. Sometimes as low as 30 or 40 percent. That's why a few years ago we decided we weren't going to use that strategy. We now use a strategy that Dr. Brothers, Dr. Zhao and I do together. Um, it's called the hybrid conversion procedure. And that's where the surgeon goes in and with a scope directs a catheter to the back wall of the heart and he does much more extensive cauterization of the back wall of the heart. And basically, what you're doing is basically creating a big scar boundary. So those, all those electrical waves traveling through run into that wall and get extinguished. So that's called a hybrid convergent procedure. So we tend to use that more in patients with persistent AFib. So with that kind of background, I'm going to go over about five or six slides and talk to you about a new technology we've acquired that we're kind of proud of because we're only the only center, in the, actually in the whole South, in the whole Gulf South that has this, this laser technology. So now I like to say, to say to patients, we can burn it, we can freeze it, now we can shine a light on it. <laughs> okay. So this is another way to do basically the same thing. It's another way to draw a circle around the vein and cause scar tissue to form. What, what the published studies have shown is that the lesion created with the laser may be more durable. That is, it may last longer. And we're going to go over a little bit about that. So this, the name of the new technology is called the CardioFocus um, laser, basically. It's called the heart light. Isn't that pretty clever, the heart light? And Jen and I have done two cases now with the heart light over the last couple weeks. Uh, the administration here is okay to us to try 10, and then they will make the final decision whether we are able to proceed with it. One of the limitations we face here is that these technologies cost a certain amount of money. This balloon, for example, costs roughly $4,500, $4,800. And the reimbursement to the hospital is a fixed amount. So the more technology we use, unfortunately, we make the procedures non-productive to the hospital and we become sort of, they want to boot us out. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about the, the laser light. So the heart light system is a balloon-based technology, just like the cryo balloon, but you can see that fluid-filled balloon. This balloon actually is more conformable. That means when you push it against the vein, it tends to oppose the surface of, this, of the anatomy much better than, say, a cryo balloon would. I was struggling today with a cryo balloon procedure whereby the patient's um, cryo balloon is a very spherical object, but the patient's vein was shaped oblong. 
and I couldn't get that square peg to fit into that round hole. Very easily, I had to do all kind of manipulations and contortions. So the nice thing about this is that it fits almost all the anatomy. That's what we like about it. And what it basically does is, instead of delivering uh, freezing energy, there's a laser, and I'll show you this setup in a second, that basically shines a laser beam in a circumferential arc around the vein. It's pretty amazing to see it. The other nice thing about this technology is that this system actually has a scope built into the catheter itself to where you can see the inside of the heart. It's kind of crude, but you can actually see the vein unlike any other technology. You can direct that laser beam in a very controlled and precise way. So Jen and I have done um, two patients um, that have allowed us to be there. You know, it's always tough to get a patient to try a new technology. Because yeah. the initial reaction is what? You want me to be the guinea pig for new technology. So the first patient was actually a physician who had read about it and, and wanted to have it done. And the other patient said, well, y'all have done one. I guess y'all know what y'all are doing. Y'all can do the other. So uh, we're going to try to do 10 patients with this. But in the published studies, which now are in the thousands, this may be and we're not sure ourselves either, this may be a much better way to do it. So this is a balloon-based technology. Again, you go in through the leg vein, and you've got to get from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart. How do we do that? Anybody know the technical lingo? It's called transeptal puncture. You actually punch a hole with the ultrasound to direct you from the right side into the left side, and then you take the technology into the left upper chamber and into the vein. So this is the cardio focus heart light. And so this is what you basically, <clears throat> when you position the balloon, when you, I don't know if we can put the lights down, when you position the balloon, you can actually see the inside of the vein. Okay? So this is a, this is a vein that what you, you see here's the shaft of the catheter, and you're looking right down the barrel of the vein with a scope built, actually built into the catheter. And then what you do is that you, you deliver energy in a very prescribed arc. And what you do is, um, I'm basically in the first couple cases holding the balloon and Dr. Zhao is directing the laser beam. We, we direct a laser in a very small arc for about 15, uh, 20 seconds. And then we move the beam over and around and complete a whole circle. What's nice about this, it doesn't make any difference whether the vein is circular or it's triangle shaped or it's oblong, it doesn't make any difference. You can, you can get around it. And so our first case went relatively quick. Our second case took about almost four hours. So we're still on our learning curve because we want to be very precise. But the nice thing about this is that the balloon will fit almost any geometry. <laughs> so we think that gives it an advantage. Say for example, a big vein that the prior balloon doesn't fit. So that's all we do is we do this in all four of the veins. <coughs> we go around in a circle. We manually do it. We, there's a control on the catheter where you, once you do this, you move it up, up, up and over, and you complete the circle. They tell me that a year from now, they'll be able to direct this laser beam automatically, and we won't even have to do anything. We can just sit there and watch it go around in a circle. What's nice about laser energy is that this doesn't do a lot of tissue trauma, okay? When we use radio frequency energy, it's very disruptive to the tissue. There's usually a lot of scar formation, and that's not good because think about this. If you're charring up the inside of the heart and those little particles fly out to the brain, you know, you, you may not have a clinical stroke, but it, there's, there's ways to detect that uh, with MRI. So we think this is much less traumatic to the tissue. It's like taking a razor blade, basically, rather than a sledgehammer. And you can direct the beam in or out. So this little balloon is filled actually with heavy water. Everybody knows what heavy water is. It was used in the first atomic bomb. Uh, so it's a, it's a, this is basically the system, the cardio focus system. And this is what it looks like. This is the console. Right here, this is the balloon catheter. It goes through a plastic tube called a sheath. 
So you, this sheet is basically what you put in first. Then you, this is actually put in um, deflated, and it goes through the sheet, and then, we'll, then you position the vein. It's got a tiny endoscope built into it. That's what enables you to visualize the, um, the inside of the, of the vein. So very precise, very accurate in trying to get vein isolation. And this is a picture of it right here with the, with the laser. You have to see the laser light as it comes out. And so when they did the first clinical trials with this, um, it demonstrated a statistically significant lower incidence of pulmonary vein reconnection. So they actually proved that the veins don't reconnect as quickly as they do with the other technologies. The one-year AFib survival rate was in excess of 80%. And the long-term data, this is where it's important, is that this was not just early data. The long-term data showed that you were AF-free at 75% or better at two, three, and four years. So the advantage of this is that it may be more durable, <coughs> longer lasting, and less likely to allow recurrence. And that's what our, um, if you look at the, at the data here, the reconnection rate with this system was, was very low compared to that with radio frequency. So that's the assumptions we're uh, proceeding with as we do this trial. Um, the nice thing again is that the lesions are contiguous, meaning they're, they, they join each other in a nice fashion. They're circumferential, they go around the whole vein. They go through the whole wall around the vein and they tend to be durable. And you can tailor the ablation energy to certain areas. Say, for example, you wanted to put more energy in one spot, you can dial up the laser strength. There been a, there's a study done by a fellow by the name of Mangrum at University of Virginia where he measured the tissue edema from this. You actually get less tissue trauma with this technique than the other. And again, you can do it in all sorts of different anatomy. Not a single vein was excluded in the clinical trial. So we don't have enough, you can go lights back up. We don't have enough data to tell you right now that this is the be all and end all. We do find there's a fairly steep learning curve. It's, it's, difficult. it's not an easy thing for us to do right now. It takes a lot of, it takes more time for us to do this than with the cryo. And Jen and I are in the case together. But um, I just want you to know there's a, there's a new, there's a new kid on the block uh, and able to accomplish uh, what we want to do. That's called a cardio-focused laser light. And I always promised you that I would bring you the, the latest, greatest. This is the latest, greatest. And when we do our first 10 to 20, we'll give you a follow-up in the support group let you know how it's gone. Because, you know, when you sit across from people who do this, you know, talk about, well, theoretically it's better because it does this, or theoretically it's better if it does that. The only thing that really counts is at a year, are you free of AFib? At two years, are you free of AFib off medicines? You know, that's the only thing that counts. Does it work or not? And of course, we think that the best way to determine that is to have the implantable link device in to make sure that we're not making a mistake. <coughs> so that's our, that's our latest, greatest. Um, and at this point, having given you the uh, overview of why we do it and what the limitations of it are, remember, if you have a trigger for AFib that's outside the vein, using this should not give you an advantage. Okay? That doesn't give you an advantage. This only gives you an advantage um, for other reasons. So there's never going to be a procedure right now that I can envision that's going to give us 100% success because there may always be an area outside of what we target that's going to allow you to go into AFib. And even if you have a successful procedure, and you're under intense stress, okay? Uh, I had a patient today at another office, had a great result for three years, sister died, intense emotional stress, went back into AFib. Now, most of those patients who have the recurrences late, uh, you cardiovert one time, and they still tend to do very well. But I'm not sure we actually have a procedure myself that cures AFib. I'm going to get into, and Jen and I talk a lot about this, when we have time, is that what we do with these procedures is that you know, we really ought to measure how much reduction in AFib burden we actually have. I'm not sure we really have a curative procedure right now. We don't tend to think of, that, of it that way anymore. 
But if we can cut your symptomatology down by 95% and cut your, cut your stroke risk down, you know, those are acceptable endpoints. Now, many patients, it's amazing. I call it the on-off switch phenomenon. They have AFib all over the place. You do one procedure and you've seen them out three, four years out. They've got a link device in or a pacemaker. Most of my data is from pacemaker. There's not been a single recurrence. It's beautiful. So there may be cure in certain selected patients. But for most patients, we're starting to think of AFib now tech, uh, technology as a way to reduce the AFib burden. So with those thoughts, Jen and I will take any any questions. Remember, this is the last support group of 2017. We need to know what you guys want to hear about, whether it be more technical stuff like this, more about <coughs> surgery, more about nutrition and lifestyle, stress reduction. I'm working on a nice stress reduction talk for next year that is so going to be very interesting. So I'll take any questions about the new technology. No questions? Yes, sir. Um, how do you compare this to the cryo, cryo technology? Well, just from two cases, I can tell you that if you've got this anatomic variant where two veins are fused together into one big vein, the cryo balloon doesn't tend to fit that very well. So we've got to do all kind of gyrations. We'll, we'll take the cryo balloon and We'll take it to the roof of the vein and freeze it, and then we'll try to come down and freeze it, and we'll rotate it to the left and freeze it, and we sometimes have to do these different manipulations. This technology theoretically, again, the key word is theoretically, offers you a big advantage for that unusual anatomy. So we haven't done enough cases right now to know, and we don't have a year follow-up on any of our patients. See, that's what we think there may be an advantage here is that the longer term results with this may be better to cryo, but we don't know. It's unproven hypothesis. Yes, ma'am, you had a question? Um, my question was how, how much longer do you think it's going to be before you finish your first 10 and then, you know. Well, the vacation schedule coming up doesn't, is not conducive to a quick resolution right. of those 10 patients, but. Right, I uh, that. Uh, I would think within the next two to three months we should have our first 10. The hospital is actually looking at us to make sure we don't blow the bank on this technology because I'm not to say they, they all they want to do is make money, that's not true, but they, they, they can't do procedures that are financial losses. They won't let us do that. So we've got to prove also that it's commercially viable to do it. We don't think that way. Me and him, me and Jen don't think that way. We think, does it give you a better result? I mean, we're, we're very results driven. I mean, I don't care, I don't care if it's a, to me, if it was a $20,000 technology and it fixed AFib, I would do my best to bring the $20,000 technology here. All we care about is that three years, four years, are you free of AFib? But the question you asked is, how long will it take to complete the evaluation phase? I would say another two to three months. Now, I will give you follow-up on it. But that won't tell us the answer. The answer is what happens a year out from doing it. Well, this is an approved, this is not experimental. We're not allowed at East Jefferson to use, I mean, we have to go through an institutional review board. We don't use any, I, don't want, to, I want to make that really clear, we don't use experimental technologies on anybody, okay? Um, we would have to go through a very extensive institutional review board to do that trial. This is already FDA approved. It's already had a several thousand patient trial. So this is not, this is not experimental. It's been through a very rigorous process because what the FDA wants to know is more than whether it's effective, what? They want to know, is it safe? Because as a rule, and remember that famous Latin phrase, primo non necessary, first do no harm. They don't really care how much whether it works. <laughs> they want to make sure you don't kill somebody doing it. And so its safety is really good. If you look at the published safety data on it, if you want the clinical trial, we can pull it for you and get it for you. But its safety data is really good. There were no fistulas, which is that dreaded complication we worry about. One of the things we worry about with the cryo balloon, and it kind of, we're always on edge, is that when you freeze the right-sided veins, 
the phrenic nerve runs right behind there. And it's in the clinical trials with the cryo balloon, they bagged the phrenic nerve, meaning they knocked it out in three point something percent of patients. Now most of those recovered, but if you knock out the phrenic nerve, that's the nerve that makes the bellows of the diaphragm enable you to inflate the lung. Okay? So you didn't see any of that with the with the, with the cardio focus. So it eliminates that risk. The second thing is it we didn't um, there was no stenosis or constriction of the vein with the laser. And even with cryo, there was a recent paper that came out suggesting it's there if you look for it sometimes. So if you look at the overall safety, this appears to have a very good safety profile. What really needs to be done one day is there'll have to be a big, huge trial where it would take about maybe 5,000, 7,000 patients, and some patients get radio frequency, some patients get cryo, and some patients get the laser, and then you follow them out one, two, three years and find out. We, that's the scientific basis for me to make a really good recommendation to you. And right now, I'll be honest with you, we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants. We think this would be better because maybe of safety and maybe because of the durability issue. We could be completely wrong. It could be a total bust. We just don't know. But in the published trials, it looked really good. Uh, yes, ma'am, in the back, and I'll come back. How do you know whether the triggers that in the heart are good for this one as a, and not good? That's a great question. Almost every center in the United States that does um, this type of atrial fibrillation work uh, starts off by isolating the veins. Now, there's multiple centers in the country that will spend many hours giving adrenaline in high doses, it's called Isopro, uh, and trying to map the non-pulmonary vein triggers. There's a lot of controversy about that because remember, you're keeping a patient on the table even longer. There's a big cost issue with the Isopro. One of the things that always bothered me was, if you find non-pulmonary vein triggers, how do you know those are the same triggers on the table as they are in the real world? And I've had a problem with that. So we, me and Dr. Zhao, don't routinely go look for non-pulmonary vein triggers. Sometimes in the hybrid, I think Jen is going after a few of them, but we don't routinely do it. But the answer to your question is, routinely, we don't know. It's an assumption based on the original papers that suggested most of the ectopy, or most of the trigger beats, come from the pulmonary veins. Now, sometimes you're lucky that you'll do the vein isolation, and you'll see spontaneous firing, and you can go map that, but that's a rarity. So we, it, it's probably true that if you spent a lot more time to go look for the non-pulmonary vein triggers, the success rate would inch up a little bit. I think that's probably true. Uh, I'm sorry, you had a question. Doctor, do you have any way before you go in to see that there's gonna be a deformity of the vein or it's not until you get in that? So how do we, the, so the question comes down to how do we assess the nature of the veins? Almost everybody that we do procedures on gets a CT scan. Some centers use MRI, but those are very accurate. You, could, you can slice the image, you could actually look inside the vein from, the, from that CT image. So everybody who has a procedure gets that. We wanna make sure there's four veins. We wanna make sure they're not coming off the roof of the upper chamber or the side or all sorts of anatomic variants, but almost every patient gets that um, CT scan. So if you see it's an odd shape, then you would almost definitely want to go. Well, that's the question is, if you see it's an odd shape, if, you, if, the, if the length and the width are not equal, so there's, it's oblong, yeah. would that mean you might be better off using the cardio focus device? Probably. I've not seen a trial that used that as a criteria for entry and compared it, but it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I agree. So the, the main use of this is going to be maybe in some unusual anatomies and, and again that durability issue. Um, there's another issue that's not as much written about and that is um, if you do an MRI scan of the brain before procedure and you do an MRI scan of the brain after the procedure, even if there's no clinical stroke, 
different technologies have different effects on the brain. So these, these little micro particulate areas that you see in the MRI sometimes, and they're worse in some technologies. So maybe the laser might be better in causing that kind of effect. Now nobody knows what that effect does. It doesn't have, seem to have any clinical effect. When they do cognition tests on patients, it doesn't seem to be a difference, but I don't know about you, but if I saw that one technology had more effect on the brain than another, it might influence what I do. So we don't know, we don't know how all these technologies are going to be linked together in some final protocol. If you talk to 100 heart rhythm specialists around the country, uh, in fact, there's a very famous heart rhythm specialist in Austin, and he'll say, the cryo balloon's a piece of junk, I don't use it. And the reason is, I can take my catheter and I can go much wider circle than the cryo balloon could ever do. It's called getting more antral. So he doesn't believe in the cryo balloon. You talk to other people, they say, God, I don't want to put my patient through a risk of a fistula, I'm going to use the cryo balloon. So if you talk to 100 different rhythm specialists, they all have their own preferred strategy. And right now, there's no right or wrong. If you're very good with your technique and you're getting good results, it's very unlikely you're going to change unless there's some dramatic randomized trial that's going to throw you another way. So everybody has their own preferences. I think this ultimately is going to be proven better, but I'm, it's just my belief. I've been wrong on other things, so we'll see. So we're doing, we're doing 10 patients. Uh, what we do, just to let you know, we don't just let you go into the room and then we pull out the, the, the uh, secret technology. Everybody we do this on, we're honest with and we say, we'd like to tell you about a new technology. Do you want to allow us to try it? Now one patient said no and basically canceled the procedure. Said, I don't want you experimenting on me. Okay? It's not an experiment. It's, it's FDA proven. It's it's uh, not an experiment to use that. But he rescheduled. Yeah, he rescheduled. Oh, he did. Yeah. Oh, I had to know that. Yeah. Okay. He said, "I want, I want it, and I want it after the first ten. Right after the first ten. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. How do you decide if you have patients? A lot of them incontinate them. Which ones you think are the good ones for this? Well, there's a there's a line of thought in our field that even with persistent AFib that you should still do the vein isolation as the first procedure and tell the patient they may require more procedures. Okay? Now, to a patient, that's sometimes a simpler approach than going into a hybrid procedure. Now, remember, the hybrid procedure is an operative procedure. There's an incision. The heart sac is opened. The patient's on a table for a long period of time. So, is it better to do everybody the same way, simply do vein isolation? Or is it better to go, if you have persistent, to go do the hybrid? Our practice has been to go to the hybrid first. Other centers would disagree. They'd say, we would maybe go do something else only after one or two other procedures. We tend to be very conservative in our approach. We don't believe in, I mean, I know Jen doesn't believe, and I don't either, we don't believe in putting people through a lot of different procedures. It would make our numbers look better, but you know, I don't like putting people through a lot of procedures. I wanna to go to what I think is the single best thing right up. In fact, we'll have many patients come in, and I'll say, um, you've got come and go, paroxysm like fib, we're gonna do a vein isolation procedure. And they say, I'm gonna give you one shot at it, what's the single best shot you can do to fix it? I said, well, if you want, if, if that's the way you phrase it, then we think the hybrid, no matter what type, is, is the best option. So we, we tend to educate our patients. We get a lot of patients that ask that. I want, I only, I'm only gonna do it one time. What's your single best shot at fixing it? Then, in our experience, it's the hybrid. So everybody, if you go to Oster, they're gonna have a different approach. If you go to Baton Rouge, they're gonna have a different approach. If you go to Boston, they're gonna have a different approach. If you go to Mayo with Gen Train, they're gonna have a different approach. Every center, and why does everybody have a different approach? It's because none of the strategies have really been pitted against one another in a huge randomized trial where everybody sits down and says, oh, that's the truth. So there's still a lot of personal preference in guiding the choice of treatment and the modality of the treatment, whether it be with one of these. 
So if you if you got an opinion from us and you went to Oshner, um, and I've got nothing but good to say about the Oshner Heart Rhythm Team, they would um, they use both cryo and they use RF, but some of their people tend to use RF more, and some of their people tend to use cryo more. So there's uh, there's honest differences of opinion about what the best strategy is. Yes, sir. This is a general question. I know you don't make the policies for the insurance companies, but in general, why wouldn't they pay for uh, a procedure, at least based on the FDA trials, that looks like it's got a higher probability of success? Well, it's theoretical. Until one has been pitted against one another in a what's called a randomized trial, the purpose of randomization is to eliminate bias. So what they would do is, in a randomized trial, everybody gets an equal opportunity to go into one of the limbs of the treatment. Until there's a randomized trial, nobody knows what the best is. We never have trouble getting approval for vein isolation procedures. Sharon can speak to this. For routine stuff, because it's so well established over the last 12 years. We do get a lot of pushback from the insurance companies about the hybrid procedure. They, they consider it experimental, okay? Now, what? there's no such thing as an experimental procedure. The equipment you use to do the procedure could be considered experimental. The procedures themselves are not considered experimental. We don't consider the hybrid procedure to be an experimental procedure. We've done now over 300. We know what our own results are. We know what our own complications are. These are not zero-risk procedures, okay? And again, as she hears a thousand yeah. times, if you've got a procedure that works 100% and fixes AFib and has zero risk, the decision making gets very, very, very easy, right? Some of them are no-brainers. When you've got a procedure that may work only 75, 80% and the complication risk is not zero, I mean, a fistula that we talked about is a very <laughs> rare complication and I could quote you maybe it's one in a thousand but if you're the one in a thousand it's a hundred percent okay now you have to balance that off against what is the risk of me continuing to be an AFib well what are those risks well we believe that if you continue to go in and out of AFib your stroke risk is going to be higher okay we believe and there's a lot of data that if you can continue to go in and out of AFib or you're in AFib, there's some suggestive data that your risk of early dementia may be higher. It's not proven, but there's some data to suggest that. If you go in and out of AFib and your quality of life is miserable and you're running to the emergency room three, four, five times a year, maybe that risk is worth it. So these are all trade-offs. There's no, there's no right or wrong answer whether you have vein isolation. It's your individual personal decision. So when the consensus group of cardiologists at the Heart Rhythm Society get together and they write what's called guidelines, and those are open to the public. If you punch in Heart Rhythm Society guidelines for AFib in Google, you'll be able to get that document. It's about a 50-something page document that goes over all the scenarios. Okay. Catheter ablation for AFib is not considered the number one therapy. The guidelines still say use pills first and reserve procedures second. Now that's probably going to change because the pills are not benign either. We had a 42 year old woman die from complications from antiarrhythmic drugs about a year and a half ago. So the pills that we use to control AFib are not benign either. So what I'm trying to paint, I'm not trying to paint a bleak picture, but no matter what road you go down with AFib, there's these hidden unknown wild cards in there. But insurance companies are based off of codes. So it doesn't matter. The insurance company don't know if they're using RFA, cryo, or laser. That, that they all have this, that procedure has a code, and that's what they approve. Yeah. They have denied. We've had a couple denied yeah. for hybrid. I can't think of one that's been denied for pulmonary vein isolation. No. 
And, and actually the hybrid was, um, it all was the same insurance company and it was an out of state insurance. That's a Blue Cross. A, a, Blue, a Cross Blue Cross out of state. Yeah. And For some reason, Blue Cross problem. gives you a lot of hard, lately they've been giving us a hard time about stuff. And I think the problem with the hybrid is um, they get very confused that there's a surgeon and an EP. And they want to say the EP part of it is outpatient and the surgeon part of it is inpatient and they can't understand. I'm on the phone with them every week explaining to them how, why we need an inpatient and why we need two different doctors, two different codes. Maybe somebody more than a, a lowly clerk should handle the paperwork. <laughs> I'm just saying. It, it takes a little fight, but, it's but we've only you, been denied a couple times. you try to do what's called peer-to-peer, -peer, and you try to talk to some of the doctors, they're not, even, they're not cardiologists, they're primary care doctors who haven't even heard about AFib ablation. You can imagine that conversation. That's no fun at all. <laughs> Don't have the patience for that. You know, one of them told me, one of them told me that it was a patient with, who, was been, who was an AFib for five years who wanted to do a hybrid procedure. He says, our guideline says you have to put them through this other procedure. I said, are you kidding me? We'll be putting them through three, four procedures. I, I know that for a fact. I know it. You want me to put him through three or four procedures rather than do one procedure to fix it? And he said, well, that's what our guideline says. I said, I think you should go revise your guideline. Absolutely. Sometimes if we can argue with them, most of the time they're reasonable. You know, if I start presenting real data to them, then most, most of the guys are reasonable and they'll say, okay, we're going to allow it this time. But we have been, you know, no matter, um, no matter what we do sometimes, no matter, it's like beating your head against the wall, you just say, I've done all I can do and that's all I can do. Because if you had to pay for this out of pocket, it's prohibitive. So that's kind of kind of an overview of where we are, where we at East Jeff are, with the different modalities of trying to, to do vein isolation. Um, there's another institution in the city that doesn't believe in the conversion as much. They use what we used to do at Tulane. They'll make incisions along the rib cage and uh, get access to the heart and use a specially designed clamp and seal off the veins that way. That's called a mini maze. We think the conversion results are much better. Now, one advantage of that, though, is that they can seal off the appendage where the clots form, whereas with the convergent, with the current technology, you can't do that. So that's one advantage of the mini maze over the convergent. You can seal off the appendage. Well, I've given you guys a lot of stuff tonight. That's... So what's new coming with vein isolation? There's um, not much, actually. This is pretty much where we're going to be for the next couple of years. Uh, there's nothing that I see or scan uh, that is better than this right now. I don't see any new surgical techniques coming around. Um, we're pretty much stuck. I, I would say for the next two to five years, this is gonna be the armamentarium that we have. I don't see any revolutions coming down the road. There's no new great drug development either because anybody see those commercials for the new <coughs> blood thinners? What, companies want to, what company wants to spend one billion dollars or more developing a drug um, when they're going to get sued out of existence? So the medical legal, the medical legal climate for new drug development is static. Um, there's not much, in Europe there's a couple things that are going on. But, you know, I always kid people that, that I'm basically one good anti-rhythmic drug away from being obsolete because Sooner or later, some bright person in a lab in New Jersey or India or New York, Beijing, wherever, is going to find the lock and key that shuts AFib off. It's going to happen. I may not live to see it, but it's going to happen. Just the pace of de development. Uh, I was talking with a nephrologist today. He says the whole field of nephrology may be obsolete because there's a guy at Stanford who's developed a way to take your own stem cells, put it in a mesh, and make an artificial kidney. They've tried that before, but now they've got one in human trials, and it works better than dialysis, and it's about the size of a, it's a half the size of this. 
and they've got 100 patients now in clinical trials or on dialysis, and, and dialysis may be obsolete in five years. It's amazing. I, I couldn't believe he said, yeah, it's, it's, it's the joke at the nephrology meetings that we're not going to have any work to do. <laughs> because once it's implanted, you don't even need much follow-up. So pace of things is developing very rapidly. So this is gonna, we're going to close our 2017 support group. I've, I've enjoyed meeting, Shannon and I have enjoyed meeting Sharon. Uh, all this is on film if you want to go back and look at the presentations. Um, and we need your, your ideas for future programs because we kind of get stuck sometimes. All right, I'll, I'll join the, the session, and uh, thanks for coming out in the bad weather. Thank you. Thank you.